A long, long time ago, I heard it on the radio. Sounds so good to me, US Navy submarines. Recruiter said, just sign here. Turns out I gave them five years. Had to get out of boot camp. They won't light the smoking lamp. Now I'm a submariner rolling in the deep surf. Top secret mission, hush, hush. No one's going to find us. Six months below the ocean, I can't remember the sun. Can't write my wife no letters that Jody's going to get her. But I won't trade this life away. Makes it worth the Navy pay. If I can't be a bubble head, I might as well just be dead. A long, long time ago, I heard it on the radio. Sounds so good to me. US Navy submarines. Left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Who, who, who? Come in, UGM 133. Your time is up. Did you hear at the back? <laughs> <laughs> A war fight from Torbay to Trafalgar with Churchill's renown. A conqueror with scepter in hand. Daily you deal in vengeance, always at the vanguard and ever vigilant. Pray to be victorious. Through turbulent waters, you are Spartan, splendid, sovereign and superb. Constantly courageous, valiant and trenchant. You repulse your enemies, seeking revenge with resolution. Be forever tireless, Swift, sure, and dread naught, as one day you too will be laid up. To the future, be astute and audacious, ambush your fears, and always be artful. In the production of space, Marxist philosopher Henri Lefebvre formulated his influential models of natural space or absolute space alongside more complex spatialities whose significance and understanding is the result of social conditions rather than purely physical formations of space. Lefebvre argued that space is above all a social product socially experienced and made by whoever is perceiving it. Tartan perfectly represents Lefebvre's multivalent formulation of space, and this multivalency is interrogated in the work of Michael Sanders, who utilizes Tartan's ability to generate space. The following images briefly indicate Tartan's operation visually and theoretically at the intersection between textiles, space, and time. In 1822, Walter Scott uses Tartan to brand George IV's tour of Edinburgh prompting one commentator to note that a tartan fit had come upon the city. Captain Kirk, a latter-day Walter Scott, orders his crew, including a kilted Scotty, to don full dress uniform to meet Abraham Lincoln. Mid-century America rejects British designer Mary Storr's imposition of tartan on its transatlantic walls. Tartan-clad Latinx Asian post-punk girl band the Linda Linders occupy the space of the LA County Library to perform Sexy Racist Boy. Japanese textile creators Nuno strip Tartan back to its fundamental grid structure. The Bay City Rollers anticipate Japanese fashion's love affair with Tartan in kimonos spuriously attributed to Bill Gibb. 
Kilts, according to how they are pleated, reveal or hide and transform a tartan's set. St. Martin receives his vision while slumbering beneath early Renaissance tartan bedding. Dom Hans van der Laan, invoking the holy trinity of figure, ground and space, miraculously transforms Grey Douglas tartan into brutalist, sanctified space. The pink elephants on parade sequence from Dumbo include shape-shifting plaid pachyderms. In 1963, my brother pushes me on a swing in tartan trousers. Tartan-covered hills signify Scotland as the night train crosses the border in Pound and Pressburger's delirious vision, I know where I'm going. Jack the Dripper's action painting meets the Edinburgh tattoo in, 19, in 2017. Puitt and Bocanegra's Manhattan Tartan Project simply summed up as we took this whole rich cult of history and superimposed it onto Manhattan. Tartan patterns incorporate literary, artistic, and mythic ideas of the space in which it is produced and experienced, and simultaneously the colonizing occupation of projected political space. While Sanders' work addresses ideas of imposed territorialization, it should also be stated that these forms of Tartan colonization are never one directional, and as WJT Mitchell proposed, empires move outward in space as a way of moving forward in time. And this movement is not confined to the external. Foreign fields towards which empire directs itself, it is typically accompanied also by a renewed interest in the representation of the home landscape, the nature of the imperial center. Okay, so Michael, this is an image of you wearing a suit made from Polaris Tartan. Can you tell us a bit more about this? Um. Yeah, this is this is a Edwards Air Force Base in California, and it's the start of a journey for the blundering nuclear tourists. So that's how it works. In about 2007, I discovered this tartan called Polaris Military, which was made by the or well, commissioned by the captain of the USS Pro Proteus in Scotland in yeah, 1964. And yeah, it's called Polaris, Polaris Military. And it was commissioned, it was, it was the first tartan to be commissioned and put in front of the Lord Lion as a nuclear weapon system, I think, and apparently hit the roof. <laughs> at the, but it got through. So here it's got the two American submariners badges on it and you can just see the Polaris missile with the nuclear missiles around the bottom. And the colorway, it's based on um, a black watch tartan, but the dark green represents the sea. And the two bright overlay colors, the, the gold and the blue, represent the two watches, changeover watches on a nuclear submarine. This is um, the American base at Holy Lock. Um, this is actually the, um, the, the dry dock. Um, the, I, think, I think the American Navy commissioned it as an act of friendship. Right. And they went to, <laughs> they went to Strone House, the local kilt makers, and they got them to make it. And I've always kind of wondered um, what it would be like to be making that tartan. And I see it as an act of cultural insensitivity, certainly when I first saw it. The more I read around the subject, it's really complex because when the Americans left Holy Lock in 1992, a quarter of the population of Dunoon were American. And actually, that, so what they say is people complained when they came and they complained when they left. But the significance, obviously, is that they had nuclear missiles on the base. And it, my work isn't anti-American, but it's the idea of a nuclear occupation. And one of the legacies of having the base there was that they pumped radioactive coolant into the lock right. and contaminated the water with cobalt-60 and tritium. So, so I see it as an act of cultural in, sort of insensitivity. And uh, let's see what the next slide is. In, in 2008, I was having a show in America with Walter Cotton about ruined archaeology and the 
the, um, the long-term storage of nuclear waste. And we came across this terrible sort of incident where there was an American base at Babylon at the end of the Gulf War, and they dug into the archaeology to fill the sandbags that they had. And, and our, our thoughts were, here you can just see some of the archaeology, the cuneiform archaeology had been used to fill the sandbags. And our reasoning, we were making work about, out, about a place called the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in New, New Mexico, which is designed to keep the nuclear waste in it for up to 10,000 years. And I reasoned that if you can't look after a known archaeological site and prevent it from damage, how are you going to look after a nuclear waste site for tens of thousands of years? You know, I think the, the, um, the half-life of plutonium is something like 190,000 years. So that would be beyond known language. And this is where you started to intervene in science. Yeah, so, so I proposed going to Camp Pendleton, which was near where we were, were working, where we, we were having a show and building a memorial to the ruined archaeology using sandbags. And I was going to work with students from Oceanside College. And uh, I, I just going back, so when we, we went to interview, I went with a friend called Anna O'Kane, and we went to interview John Curtis, the man who'd taken these pictures at the British Museum. And I suddenly started to think, if we're working with the students, and some of them may be the brothers and sisters of Marines who have either come back injured or have come back in body bags, and I don't really know why I thought this was a good idea, but I thought, I'll get a suit made in the Polaris <laughs> Tartan to lighten up the atmosphere a bit, which on hindsight yeah, okay. doesn't really add up. But this, so I commissioned the suit, and this is Trevor Lewis in uh, Lincolnshire making the suit for me. And I had a piece of the Polaris Tartan as a sample, and it's very soft, so I took the sample to him and said, can you make a suit out of this? And he just said, and is Sir on the stage? Which I thought was, <laughs> was great. And, and he really got the idea and he said, let's make it with big lapels, <laughs> you know, because I said I wanted it to be like a blundering tourist, which then became the blundering nuclear right. tourist. But as in anything, you know, you can't actually make up stuff that's as good as the truth. So this is the um, US Navy, naval pipe and drums band, a, a US Naval Academy pipe and drums band. I, probably it's in, it's probably in Tartan Week in New York, and they all wear, they still wear the Polaris Tartan all these years later. So in this Tartan, which we've put on display in the exhibition as part of the area, considering your work, if you look closely, I think you can see that, at the back, hopefully, we can see that the bright yellow, blue, and black stripes are in fact made up of the names of nuclear-related spaces and missiles, yeah? And so it, it's a kind of stealth translation of tartan here, you know, you I, could argue. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted the use of the tartan to be like a vector for an idea. It seemed like the Polaris one had all this hidden symbology in it. Yeah. And I wanted, so I've added in lists of places I've been to and places I wanted to go to and nuclear ac acronyms and the names of nuclear weapons. And I was making this to put on the telephone box, which is in the exhibition. And this is outside um, uh, the MOD headquarters in London. But a little, um, this is a close up of it, it, I wanted it to be like a giant tin of sort, shortbread, but I also wanted it to be like a Rosetta Stone, taking it back to the nuclear... The, Meaning the kind of, it would help us decipher? Or? Yeah, well, it, just taking it back to the archaeology, in right. a way, and because it's, like, all bundled in there. And they're kind of... It doesn't really add up to anything, in a way, but... So we put shortbread, a shortbread CND and a submarine and a Vulcan bomber in as well. So... So it's, yeah, it's about transmitting an idea secretly through the cloth, I suppose. Right. Yeah. And just a little, a sort of a, an unintended consequence of it is it occurred to me under the 2000 Terrorism Act that the people photographing the, 
tartans might be unintentionally collecting information that might be useful to a terrorist <coughs> and might be breaking section 58 of the terrorism laws. So, you know, it was just a sort of thought that that might be the case. So then, uh, I, um, then I decided this is um, a kind of famous Cold War joke um, where the Americans feared that the Russians would be able to make an atomic bomb and, and sneak it into America. And they said that they were pretty sure that they got the bomb, that they just hadn't developed the suitcase yet. And I decided to <laughs> go to Cuba with the suitcases with an atomic bomb in them to, to reenact the Cuban Missile Crisis right. um, <laughs> and have this pop-up exhibition. And, and the idea of the suitcases were that they fitted inside each other like, um, is it a matriosca? Matriosca, yeah. yeah. And the Russian word for deception, which was used about the Cuban Missile Crisis, was, is maskirovka. And I just really like the fact that the two words sounded similar. So I have this piece of Russian nuclear weapon, but it turns out it's got asbestos in it, so I didn't take the real weapon. But since then, I've extended out. This is the uh, 30th anniversary of the enclosing of RAF Molesworth, which is a, a cruise missile base. And I take the piece of nuclear missile in the suitcase to the base to kind of metaphorically take the weapon to where it would be aimed at. We've got five minutes, Michael. Oh, I've just been told, okay, so. so we just skip through these. This is fast lane, just, just to show that the US, that the the Navy don't want to be, the Royal Navy don't want to be outdone by the US Navy. They still pollute the, the, the lock at Fast Lane uh, with the same radioactive isotopes. I find it, an, it's a really strange place. It's, it's sort of, um, Dr. Ellie Carpenter says it's designed to manufacture fear, but it, because of the deterrent aspect, it's designed to manufacture fear and reassurance in equal measure. Right. I don't know if that makes sense. So I started this project, we might have to whisk through this, called We Pump Unseen, about the radioactive effluent that the submarine base were putting in into the lock. And I just adapted their submarine's motto of We Come Unseen to We Pump Unseen. And on my blazer bad, which is over there, um, I, I, I decided to move away from Tartan a bit and had some casual wear made for the submarine, <laughs> briefly. But Tartan but, will reoccur, won't it? Yeah, 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 but but then while I was there, I went to Coolport, which is the Trident missile store, and I wore the, the Tartan suit. And I'm trying to look defiant, but I was very <laughs> nervous because I, you know, even though I negotiated with with the the Ministry of Defence to be there, they, I still was stopped and questioned five times. So, come on then, Michael, tell us. <laughs> What has Tartan and the nuclear presence in Scotland got to do with Captain Linton 1975 hit, Love Will Keep Us Together, and Joy Division's Love Will Tear Us Apart from 1980? So, John, it, sounded, it seemed a good idea at the time, it didn't did. it? But, so, that was 1975, only five years later, and th this is a genre of kind of t a music called The Answer Song. So there's a songs like Hit the Road Jack, another follow-up version will be brought out called... Um, I hit the road, and allegedly, and this is off Wikipedia, Love Will Tear Us Apart is an answer song to Love Will Keep Us Together. And I, so that was, I was thinking about call and response, and I discovered that the Navy have created their own tartan for Fast Lane and, and the nuclear submarine base called HMS uh, Neptune, which significantly is a restricted tartan. So only it says that, you know, you have to get permission of the commanding officer to wear it. So I can't wear it. So I thought as a response in a call cool response way, this is very tenuously <laughs> linked to Captain Snail, I would create my own tartan called um, Salt 3 Submarine. And th the original idea came about because I wanted to find a way of making the nuclear pollution tangible. And, in, and it's hard to work out how much there is, but call me old fashioned, I like my water without radioactivity <laughs> in it. And so it's just a concern to me of finding a way to make it a 
sort of a tangible thing. So I registered a brand of salt with the idea that we would go to the collect water from outside the submarine bases at, at Devonport and Fast Lane and Rosyth and then make salt from it. So we'd have an unusable brand of table salt. And then I thought, well, we could brand the table salt in the Salt 3 submarine tartan as well. And this is the tartan. And it, woven through it, it, it's kind of a mixture of rust, which is for the laid up submarines, which I was saying in the poem, dark blue for the submarine base at night. And then the other stripes are cobalt 60. And there's white for the salt and tritium, which is the other radioactive isotope. And then the brilliant weaver I worked with, Johnny, we talked about it and he said, well, we should add a little gray stripe to represent the idea that all of this is being put upon, that all of the decisions about this are made in Whitehall and Westminster. Mm. So we wanted the gray to sort of represent the seats in Westminster. Right. And this is Johnny, the, the weaver. Uh, I, I was very keen to, to work with someone. He didn't have to, to approve of the project, but he had to, um, he had to know what it was about. That's Johnny McKinnon, and he was absolutely great. So he wove the short sample, which is in the in exhibition. The okay. So in the last few moments, Michael, yeah. what, what next in this? Well, the, an idea is to make a kind of questioning monument where we put it in somewhere like the Kibble Palace in Glasgow, the obelisk, which looks like the Trinity Memorial, which is where the first nuclear explosion took place. It's made of tartan, and then we pour the salt water from Fast Lane and Devonport into the base, and it gets drawn up through the monument and through evaporation, it creates the salt. And I like the idea of doing that because I'm intrigued about when the water stops being seawater and becomes nuclear waste. In a sense. Right. And if I present the idea to the Kibble Palace or to the National Museum of Scotland or someone, they might say, we really like the idea, but we're worried about the health and safety of whether it's turned into, you know, a nuclear waste. And I go, yeah, but the submarine base are putting, you know, it's just seawater. So that's, that's where I want to take it. Great. Does that make sense? Well, it does. It does. Thank you very much, Michael. I think we've got some time for q &A. Yeah. A couple of minutes for q and <clears throat> Yeah, there's a question there. Last one question. Uh, what tartan are you doing on your trousers? This is uh, US Navy Ed Could we have the little 12? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, James will be able to tell us, but Ed is a secret sort of submarine and listening base just north of here in, in Ed And I think it was commissioned in 1985. Is that right? By the wife of the commanding officer? But I guess done in, in an act of friendship. And I, it's sort of. Um, Red, white, and blue, like the American flag, I think. Is the Any other questions? Do we have? Yeah, there's one. <laughs> Sorry, just before the light um, Thank you for that. That was very powerful, especially because if people read the news this morning, um, the US and UK or um, bombed Yemen last night. So um, I, I'm, I'm quite moved by this. Um, I want the question I have, I, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to articulate it, but it's about nationalism because I think you're playing with that a, a bit because you're using tartan to. So, so I wanted to reappropriate the tartan in the first instance. And the work is in my mind about cultural insensitivity, even though it turns out that, I mean, just I was just outside and I was talking to a woman and her two sisters had married Americans in 1964 and she noticed this piece of work in the exhibition. But then I went on to create my own tartan and I'm not Scottish. So I was expecting to be shot down in a way or be prepared to be a lightning rod for about whether a tartan is a nationalistic thing or whatever, you know. Um, I mean, certainly the, submarine, the first submarine base being in Holy Lock 
contributed to a sense of nationalism. Um, and people re really resented Macmillan choosing without any decision in Scotland, you know, the fact that the American base was cited there. Um, so it's just, so I don't, I don't have a particular answer to it, but those are the things that swirl around in my head. Can you, uh, that helps what I was thinking about, because at some point you said your, your interest is not, you're not interested in being anti-American, but just more, and, certainly and that, that explains. The <laughs> idea of a nuclear occupation. So when I went to Cuba and showed the work, people were initially really suspicious of it. And I said, but we're both from small islands which hosted the nuclear weapons of a superpower. You know, albeit that Britain has its own nuclear weapons too. And then people were really interested in it. So it's more about the idea of, I mean, you know, I'm fervently anti-nuclear, but, but it's more about the idea of it being fundamentally undemocratic mm -hmm. to me. You know, it's so secret. Mm -hmm. um, Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think I think cool. that's all. So thanks once again, Thank Michael. <laughs>to welcome back Kirsty um, to present the final session for today um, and you all know Kirsty so I, I, I'm not going to introduce her but um, Kirsty is going to present the final session and the speakers which is discussing the global diaspora of Tartan. Thanks Kirsty. Um, of the afternoon, I'll be speaking with um, Avalon Fotheringham and Talika Kirkland, um, who'll be joining me this afternoon to discuss the global diaspora of Tartan, speaking specifically to Madras, um, whether that is within India or within the Caribbean, um, which was a really important part of the exhibition um, and of the curatorial narrative, and both Talika and Avalon were crucial parts um, of, the, of the creation of Tartan. Uh, Talika was part of our advisory panel that we've discussed um, quite a lot throughout the day. And uh, Avalon was integral in selecting the textiles within the case study on Madras, which you can see within the exhibition. Um, it was really important for the curatorial team to present Madras within the exhibition and to dispel some of the myths um, around its inspiration, very much presenting it as a textile in its own right, which uh, Tilika and Avalon will talk about. So to give you a sense of how um, this final session will be set up, so um, Avalon and Talika will um, present on their research uh, separately and then we'll have a discussion between the three of us, followed by, of course, an audience um, Q&A session. So to introduce Avalon, um, so Avalon is a curator in the South Asian Textiles and Dress Collection at the Victorian Albert Museum in London. She studied fibre and material practice at Concordia University in Montreal and the history of design at the RCA London. Before taking up the post of curator, uh, she um, worked as the research assistant for the 2015 exhibition, The Fabric of India at the v &A, and she's the author of the Indian Textile Sourcebook. Um, and she's also part of the Connecting Threads project that she'll speak more on, so if I can invite Avalon um, up to the stage. Uh, thank you so much. This has been such a fascinating day. Um, if we could have my first slide. Ah. There we go. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, after such an incredible day celebrating the heritage of Scottish tartan, it feels a little controversial to come back to... Uh, the, the leading point that I have to make today, which is that multicolored grid-based patterns are, of course, not belonging to any one culture. They occur all around the world. Patterns formed of balanced sets, of intersecting lines of various widths and colors can be found across the planet um, in all sorts of different permutations. India, which is home to some of the oldest and most diverse textile traditions in the world, is no exception to this rule. In fact, some of the earliest surviving fragments of fabric that can be attributed to India have tartan-like designs, like this piece on the left, which was discovered in a late Roman era port in Egypt. 
Pieces like this one demonstrate that India was not only producing but also exporting such patterns from a very early date. And centuries of Indian art tell us that both simple and complex Czech patterns have remained consistently popular in the region over this time. Considering that South Asia is a region of the world about the size of Europe and it's home to hundreds of different languages, thousands of dialects, and as many different cultures, it's no surprise that there is no one South Asian word that describes checked patterns produced across the region. Rather, the names of checked fabrics range from words which describe a fabric's purpose to its fibers, its weave structure, its colorway, the size of its check, the finish of the fabric, its production center, or its destination market. For instance, the term lunki checks might refer to a wide variety of different check styles that are used to pattern lungis or skirt cloths. Whereas the term gingham once referred specifically to cottons that were woven with doubled warps in the vertical stripes. And what set Vetapalam checks apart was not the color or the size of the pattern, but the special finishing process in which the cotton was polished to a papery sheen. In the 18th century, cotton handkerchief trades, uh, in the 18th century cotton handkerchief trade, South Indian checked handkerchiefs were generally known by the name of the Indian port through which they had been exported. Thus, there were pulikat handkerchiefs, pondicherry handkerchiefs, trunkbar handkerchiefs, and of course, by the end of the 18th century, Madras handkerchiefs, which were all named after their respective South Indian ports. From these ports, South Indian checked handkerchiefs, which measured about a yard square, so much larger than the pocket handkerchiefs of today, uh, were sent to Southeast Asia, East Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Americas to be worn as head wraps, neckerchiefs, and clothing. And because global demand for these textiles was so high, competition between the European East Indian companies that traded in them was incredibly fierce. They fought wars for control of the port cities and weaving villages that these handkerchiefs traveled through, each company vying to get the best handkerchiefs at the cheapest prices. But by the early 19th century, as we know, the British East India Company had become the dominant European power in South India and India broadly, and Madras handkerchiefs exported out of the British-controlled port of Madras had become the dominant variety of checked South Indian handkerchief. Today, the term Madras is used to describe a wide variety of checked cotton cloth from South India, as well as their foreign imitations. But importantly, madras never became a term used to describe a whole branch of checked patterns in general. Few of us, for example, would look at uh, the pattern of a Scottish kilt and think, ah, a madras. In fact, prior to the 19th century, there weren't really any generally accepted terms for tartan-like checks as a pattern style. The swatch at the top left, for example, is a sample of an early 18th century French siamoise supposedly named such because it Im imitated the kinds of fabrics that were being worn in Siam or Thailand. While the two Indian swatches at the bottom were known in the 18th century as cherry dairies and bajutaputs, um, among other Indian origin names that were used to describe such checked cotterns. But from about the early 19th century on, more and more Europeans came to view multicolored checks as a particularly Scottish style of pattern, to the extent that the words tartan and plaid came to dominate over all the other words that we might we once used to describe such textiles. It's unclear just how and why this happened, to me at least, but I suspect that it is rooted in the Highland Revival fashions of Europe uh, seen in the late 18th and the early 19th century. I don't think it's a coincidence, for example, that around the same time that Scottish tartan was becoming widely popular in European fashion, Europeans traveling around the world began to use the words to describe patterns that they were seeing in other parts of the world. In the texts that I have included here, which are just English language, but there are other European languages examples as well, multicolored checked fabrics are encountered by Europeans as far afield as Myanmar, uh, Indonesia, and the Punjab are all described as resembling Scottish tartan. And these authors were probably just, were, were certainly just suggesting, were, were, they're not suggesting that these patterns were Scottish in origin. They were just trying to give their readers a sense of the design. 
But by the mid-19th century, Scottish tartan had become so conflated with multicolored check patterns in general of all kinds that even these simple Indian checks of the piece on the right here was described as imitating foreign, namely British, patterns, causing considerable confusion. In the 1866 text that I quote here, John Forbes Watson, who was a Scottish specialist in Indian textiles, expressed his uncertainty about making such attributions. He suggested that such styles of check actually might be Indian in origin, but at the same time, he was unable to reconcile their similarity to tartans. The relationship between Scottish tartan and Indian madras remains a tangled one even today, as historians debate whether and to what extent one design tradition influenced another. And as the tartan exhibition has so fascinatingly demonstrated, Tartan itself is a deeply loaded word, one that evokes strong associations with Scottish place, heritage, and identity. So I want to end by simply asking, how does using the word tartan to describe a pattern impact our perceptions of origin and ownership? What histories do we give a textile when we call it tartan? And what histories are we potentially taking away? Thank you. I can invite uh, Talika uh, to stage, please. Um, so Talika Kirkland is a lecturer in cultural and historical studies at the University of the Arts London, London College of Fashion, a PhD candidate at Goldsmiths University, and the founder and creative director of the Kosham Institute of the African Diaspora, an organisation dedicated to enabling the study and dress of clothing and dress history from the African diaspora. Okay, hello everybody. Um, so I'm going to try and pick up where Avalon left off. So um, we are understanding that um, Madras essentially is not uh, a Scottish fabric. However, I started my research by asking why does it look so much like tartan? Um, and so this image here, um, which is from a 2014 project, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, is a mixture of different types of checked patterns. Is this going to work? If I, yeah, so, so this in the middle is madras from the Caribbean, specifically bandana and um, another madras here. Bandana, I will explain to you in a moment, is specific to Jamaica. This is a um, tartan, an actual tartan. This is a lungi, and this is a shuka from Kenya. And so our whole project was really about, really about trying to explore the grid more than explode it. Um, but let me, which one goes? Right there, right. So you've just seen this from Avalon. No, stop. No, Jonathan. <laughs> it's got, all right, a little bit of accompaniment, all right. Um, so this image um, of the linen market at Rosso, um by Augustino Brunias, thank you, Lizzie. <laughs> um, um, it's, first of all, Brunias is a bit of an um, unreliable narrator and portraitist of particular environments in the 18th and 19th century because he always tried to present um, enslaved people as being happy and enjoying their time as slaves and you know having a, a jolly old time in um, essentially moments where they had no autonomy or agency. However, we do understand that um, this particular image and images within his series does denote some type of um, environment that was actually taking place. There were markets on Sundays and there were um, markets that were run by enslaved people that were selling produce in exchange for fabrics and in exchange for being able to buy um, pieces of madras. Also, hello, yes. Also, the, um, a lot of the plantation owners who themselves were Scottish were buying madras to dress their enslaved populations. So I can't remember, I think it was Rosie. Hello. Um, when you were mentioning earlier on about the guy who dressed, had, 
made the tartan for the Highland pile that he, I was like in my mind, like that's so indicative of what was happening in the Caribbean, but obviously they didn't have a choice and they weren't servants, they were um, enslaved people. And so when we move on, um, when we move on to the beginning of the 20th century and we have the use of Madras fabric in what has now become, so we've gone from this, right, where people are buying in the market, buying fabrics that they're able to use to kind of embellish their own dress styles. Um, there was someone else today that was talking about enslaved populations just being allowed to wear white or just being allowed to wear very basic materials, some of them. And so they were allowed sometimes to buy embellished fabrics like this one here. This is very similar to the type of bandana that we see today and these ones here. So they were allowed to wear things that were slight embellishments only on a Sunday and on special occasions like Christmas, right? However, by the time we get to the 20th century, we are now, beginning of the 20th century, we're now taking that to be something that is being used as a sense of tradition, right? So something that was, on, on one hand, used to um, denote an enslaved wear, slavery wear, is now being used as something that is traditional to the island's own heritage and understanding of themselves. This outfit here, now where's me little, where's me light? Anyway, on the, on the far, um, where am I? Right. On the far right, the ladies are wearing what is called a wabduyet. It's a very specific outfit that is a full grand robe with a foulard and um, lace, French lace under skirts, lots of petticoats and things like that. This outfit, uh, as well as a madras head wrap, this outfit has, um, which is called the Wabduit, has been updated, if you like, by the middle to the end of the 20th century, to the point where we get now, where we have a jeep, which is um, the jeep has changed to be broidery anglaise mostly, with cotton, and still the madras skirt to denote a um, traditional, traditional garment in the Caribbean. Now, not all Caribbean islands have this particular outfit. This is, um, this lady's from Martinique. This lady on the, on the um, side here is from Martinique, but the far right is Dominica. The, um, right, I wanna go, I'm gonna jump ahead of myself because I wanna talk about this before I talk about that. Right, as I was just saying, so all of the um, islands don't have the same madras but some islands have a very particular madras. So what, what I found very interesting in my research is that as I started to go from island to island and ask questions about madras, I started to realize that there are some islands that have a specific colorway in their madras, which I started to realize was very similar to the way tartans have their clanships, right? And already, as I'm hoping, but perhaps not, you guys know, um, there were a lot of plantation owners who were of Scottish heritage and there were a lot of names in the Caribbean that are Scottish. And so it really kind of stuck in my mind how there is this link back to Scotland even though the fabric isn't Scottish, right? And so it kept kind of coming back to me that why is there this Scottish connection? So here we have Montserrat. And each, what I also find interesting from the research is that each island has and each island's fabric has a little bit of a um, relation back to their colonial history. So in Montserrat, um, which is known as the Emerald Isle and had a lot of um, Irish indentured servants, you have a mostly green, orange and white colorway in their madras. In Jamaica, um, who just to be difficult calls their madras bandana, um, their madras is red, white, and blue. And then in Martinique, which actually uses lots of different types of madras, 
but a lot of them addresses have a very distinct blue and red that run through them on the basis of a green or a yellow or something like that. And as well, all of the French islands seem to be involved in using some form of broidery and glaze or some form of lace to um, trim their outfits. So I want to go back to this just to say that in 2014, our project, which I called um, Tartan, its journey through the African diaspora. This was our first major project in, from the Costume Institute of the African Diaspora. And it was specifically to answer this question of why does Madras look like Tartan? And it, what I found is that actually, in the end, we ended up telling the story of um, colonial remnants, right? And how colonialism left this residue in its colonies and amongst the people who were left in the colonies and what those people did with that residue. Right? and how they used that colonial legacy to then develop their own sense of identity and their own sense of traditions and their own sense of who they were. And what I found really interesting is their sense of traditions and who they are and what they're about started to mirror and echo the people who had um, enslaved them or the people who had colonized them. And I wanted to, I think that's the last one, finish on this um, slide, which are four Caribbean tartans that are registered at the Scottish Tartan Registry to kind of bring it full circle to say that there is no way that a people can go through colonization and those remnants and residuals of colonization do not then become one of the building blocks to who they understand themselves to be. So we've had a lot of discussion today about um, diasporas and, you know, the American diaspora and the Canadian diaspora, Scotland, and da 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 But you know what? Half of that legacy and diaspora legacy are people in the Caribbean too. My name's Scottish. A lot of my friends' names are Scottish. You know, a lot of the, the um, history and legacy of what people understand. And you have to understand as well that in the Caribbean, it's still a very much a colonial mindset. So sure, people want to make sure they understand themselves to be Jamaican or Dominican or St. Lucian or whatever. However, the behavior is still very colonial because the understanding was that these people were nothing. And so to be something, they had to mimic colonial behavior to be seen as something and somebody. And colonial behavior meant mimicking the Scottish. And so to come round now and have these tartans that are actually registered as being indicative of the island, I think in itself is some kind of weird poetry, <laughs> right? And I'm just gonna um, leave it there with that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Silica and Avalon. They were both. So, yeah, sorry. Um, they were just such fascinating um, presentations. And I think I'm just going to go right into questions. I think we've just got a couple of 10. OK, wonderful. Thank you so much. 10 minutes for, um, for a discussion. So, um, I think both of you have already touched upon this in your presentations. But what I would really like to kick off with is the idea of place, which has really resonated, I think, throughout today. Um, so many of the presentations have, have touched upon the importance of. Of place, so I'd like, yeah, I'd kind of extend the question of how you think that Madras, whether it's in the Caribbean or whether in, in India, speaks to place and people and environment and their specific place um, of production. Um, well, it's a really interesting question with the with the history of Madras in India, and we've been having a lot of conversations, uh, and this is something that the Connecting Threads project is now moving into more deeply into how Madras is referred to within South India. Yeah. Um, but from what we understand at the moment, that term is not being used by the locals who are wearing Madras. Mm. Madras was only ever a export name. It was what denoted the fact that it came from South India for consumers who were outside of South India. Um, and I think that it's very closely connected to place in that sense because it's literally named for the place that it comes from, but also uh, because as the Industrial Revolution allowed for imitations to be made in other places, you then get real madras, yeah. uh, which is to be distinct from imitation madras that is not coming from South India, that is being made in 
Britain and in America and in China and other places. So there is a, a, a real significance to the Indian origin of Madras, uh, which is very, very, which is inherent to its name. At the same time, I don't think the relationship of South Indians to Madras is the same as the Scottish Tatarans. Yeah, I was going to ask whether there's any. Because I was reading, there's a UNESCO report, I think, around protecting Indian textile heritage or specific places of making um, within India. And does that extend to Madras or...? So there, no? there is a system, a geographical indication yeah. system for Indian textiles, uh, which is used to denote the authenticity of certain traditional textiles based on them being made in their traditional place of manufacture. But the thing is that Madras checks are made throughout yeah. India and, and even just in South India they're made throughout South India so even when it was being exported through Madras it wasn't always being made in the city of Madras yeah. it was being made in villages outside the city of Madras so there is no one place that you could say this is the home of Madras yeah. necessarily um, it's just too broad of a, a pattern tradition. Yeah. Um, so my answer to that question is very much looking at the, or understanding the Caribbean to be a bit, and this sounds rude in a way, but the kind of dumping ground for um, everything that was coming through the British Empire, mm -hmm. British Empire, the French Empire, the Dutch. Um, and so understanding Madras and its sense of place, kind of for people in that region, they have so absorbed Madras into their sense of identity and um, but it really speaks to that colonial history right um, particularly in islands that don't really have very much of an Indian population I mean if it's not Trinidad like Trinidad has got the largest Indian population outside of India right but the other islands don't really have a substantial Indian population, but they all understand Madras. Um, and so it really does speak to that legacy of understanding a place in India where most of them have never been and will likely never go to. And, but they all understand this particular thing and how it has a sense of who they are and what they're about. Mm -hmm. No one is trying to deny their history but it very much is like a marker of their national identity, yeah. if you like. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I guess on the flip side of that, do you ever see it used, or maybe not even flip sides, um, almost kind of simultaneously or kind of complementary to that? Do you ever see it used as um, uh, as an act of act of resistance or a, a form of protest being used as a textile? Not so much to be, I haven't, I haven't seen it being used as a form of protest or resistance in the Caribbean. Um, again, because of how it came into the social consciousness. Yeah. And so it, because it came into the social consciousness through um, the process of slavery, then it kind of always speaks to that. And, yeah. so, and so in a way, accommodating it in terms of owning it, is in itself a type of resistance, yeah, absolutely. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, we're not going to look at this as something that um, spoke to our enslavement. We're going to look at, some, at this as something that we now own and claim. Yeah, and empower yourself yeah, through and it, this basically. Is, this is mine yeah. and no one can't tell yeah. me, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think what you, I think that slide that you showed at the end, I think that was, yeah, really powerful for, for demonstrating that yeah, um, yeah. as well. Yeah, Avalon in terms of, yeah, the, I don't know, the kind of, yeah, like the, the idea of the... Yeah, an act of resistance or a kind of, yeah, against kind of colonial oppression. Do you ever see that from Madras being used within? I'm not within aware of any no. specific Madras related yeah. forms in which that's been used within India. Yeah. Um, the impact of colonialism on dress in India was, was very class based uh, for, for the period of colonization. Um, and I think that that had a big impact on not just the not just the fabrics, but the where you got your clothes, whether or not yeah. they were made in Europe, for instance. So yeah. the, the use of madrasas, um, I haven't come across any instances of that. I do know through the course of our research, and you would know more about this than, than I, but the Tignon laws in the Caribbean mm. 
about um, women of color covering their hair, madras kerchiefs were some of the, the popular items yeah. by which to get around the intention of those laws, which was to enforce a kind of invisibility by creating a, a even more uh, fashionable recognition, recognition ability. Yeah, mm. so I guess a form of that. Um, I've just seen we've got two minutes. So I'm going to ask one final question before we open up to the audience. Um, so we've seen throughout the day, so there's been presentations um, on, on Gaelic and colour and, of course, theatre and how language and music are intrinsically linked to the production of textiles and the context to which they're produced. Um, can you both speak to how this is pre present in, in Madras? Thank you for that question, because um, someone This obviously asked, leads to, I think, what, I guess what was supposed to be in the... Yeah. Someone asked me... Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, going to show, yeah. I was going to show a clip today of um, s someone actually wearing madrasa, a nine night, right? Now, a nine night in the Caribbean is when someone dies, there, is, there are nine nights to celebrate the death of the person, and then they're buried on the ninth night. And the ninth night is when dancing and music and song and, and basically stamping on the ground happens so that the spirit of the person cannot leave the body and come and haunt the family, right? And at nine nights, people will generally, depending on which country and which culture, people will generally wear whatever madras is linked to that particular culture. So I was going to show that video, but I didn't have it. But the reason um, that I, I was glad that you asked that question is that my jumper today, someone asked me about my jumper, right? And I want to just Language show, that, I just yeah. want to show my jumper, right? My jumper. <laughs> um, if anyone wants to read it. Right, <laughs> so, so my jumper are, is um, musical instruments. Musical instruments that are made out of um, flora and fauna and things that are found um, in the Caribbean because they couldn't have things that made that, you know, they couldn't have musical instruments themselves. So they made musical instruments out of conch shells and, and the washing board and, and anything like that. And so when we're talking about the development of culture and the development of using material culture to identify yourself, along with the conch shell and the tube sticks that you beat and the, the, the washboard that you're supposed to wash, but you're getting a fork to scrape with, Along with that comes the madras yep. that then you, is used to be like, I'm going to use this to tie my head. I'm going to use this to tie my head. And everybody knows that the, the three points I got on the tie denotes this particular thing or connotes this particular thing about me. I am the, I am the lord of the dance right now because I got these three <laughs> points and I'm scraping the, the thing. So I am the one who's in charge yep. of the dance. Right. So I think those things together. Um, Being imbued with symbolism. and 100%. Yeah. yeah. Um, Avalon, do you uh, my colleague Meha just informed me today that there's a very famous song called the, the Lungi Dance, <laughs> um, which perhaps we can put up afterwards, which is, which is all, all about Madras, <laughs> dancing in Madras. No discovery as well. <laughs> yes. Um, I think we're probably just at time, so I'd like to thank uh, Avalon and Talika for, yeah, for our conversation so far and then open it up to some audience questions. <laughs> We've actually got an online question, oh, wonderful. our first and last of the day, if you're <laughs> happy for me to, to read this out. Um, unfortunately, we won't have time for any further questions after that, but obviously please do grab Talika and Avalon if you want to pick their brains. Um, this is specifically for Talika. I knew it would be. <laughs> <laughs> With the exception of Jamaican bandana, many of the examples you showed seem to be predominantly from islands colonised by the French. I know these islands often change colonial governance through the 18th and 19th centuries, but why do you think Madras seems to appear in French colonised Caribbean rather than the British? Uh, and that's from Emma. Well, the French also um, were, having, were importing from India as well, from Pondicherry, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, the, the, the French and the British and the Dutch were full on having an argument over which ports in India they were going to um, control as well as having a fight over which islands in the Caribbean they were going to control. So we're fighting in South Asia, and we're also fighting in the Americas. And so, therefore, there, there are um, Madras traditions in French islands, in British islands, in Dutch islands, because of this history. Yeah. If I can yeah, add, add a bit to that, um, we've, we've actually come across archival documents from the British East India Company that discuss the changing of hands 
of certain islands from French control to British control, and the impact of that on the East India Company's buying practices, because immediately, immediately, they're saying, we need to go find all of the places along the Indian Southeast Coast that was supplying the French East India Company for kerchiefs to go to the Caribbean so we can buy up that stock and yeah. sell it to those islands instead. So they just very swiftly took on the, that uh, supply route um, immediately after the French were, were out of the region. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So we haven't scripted this bit at all. So this is supposedly our closing remarks, isn't it? Yes. Um, I think it was, was it you, Ari, who suggested that we should all think of something that struck a chord with us particularly in yeah. the day and ruminate on it, but not for long, I assure you. <laughs> but I, don't, I don't know, I suppose, well, should I kick off, I suppose? Please do. Apart from <laughs> thanking everybody who's come today and all the brilliant speakers, and, you know, it, it's been an absolute joy to hear everybody speak today and be part of this. Um, I suppose what has struck me is I, the, the richness of debate that Tartan continues to generate. And I suppose if I were to say it goes probably right back to the beginning of the conference and David's exploration of the grid and an understanding of the grid as being a structure that on one level is rigid and perhaps constraining, but also is theoretically and, and actually visually endless. And I, I, I suppose for me, a lot of what everybody's been talking about is there is this thing that seems to be perhaps associated with ideas of certain places, certain ideas of nationality, certain ideas of imposed, imposed restrictions. But at the same time, Tartan seems to be this cloth, this pattern, this phenomenon that everybody still can make their own, deconstruct, reconstruct. And I think we see it all the time, and I've seen it all the time in the show, when people have been dressing up in their version of what they like to wear as tartan to come and see the show, it seems to still generate this incredible ability to allow you to construct yourself wherever you are. And I, I think that's what's come across, even you know, with the last conversation we were having about perhaps Madras in the Caribbean and the fact that it was perhaps an imposed tradition, it is still evolving, I guess, it, you know, and it is now waiting, I guess, to be developed and evolved by you know, new generations, perhaps in the Caribbean and everywhere else. And so that's kind of what I'm taking away, which is a bit woolly, well, excuse the pun, but I, 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 you know, that will do, I think, for me. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. Um, mines was I think I touched upon it quite a lot in the yeah the session um, that I've just spoken on. But yeah, the idea of sense and place and location is something I think that has really resonated um, throughout the whole day. And yeah, going back to Dawn and Rosie's conversation um, at the beginning of the day, the idea of you know these international networks and international reach. I think that was really beautifully summed up um, in the last section. Um, and the idea of, yeah, just being, you know, this incredible transformative textile that continues to have meaning and continues to have symbolism. And it's very much, I think, one of the things we wanted to do with the exhibition was look at how tartan is almost kind of in the eye of the beholder. It's how it's worn, it's how it's used, it's how it's constantly been reinvented by, by designers um, within Scotland and, and out with Scotland. And I think, um, yeah, today has just exemplified that, really. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep mine quite brief, but I think it's um, the historian archaeologist in me has really enjoyed a lot of the papers. And Peter, you're, you know, delving into the biography and analysis of the Glen Affric textile. It's just so super exciting. And then Hugh, I thought your um, observation about the kind of context of your work in the 1990s, 80s, and thinking about 30 years now, where we are today, 
time and and this idea of where we are in this very moment is very prescient and in, in kind of like what I'm thinking about and and where is Tartan going next in the future so with one foot in the past and one foot <laughs> looking to to the future unraveling those threads embracing the chaos um yeah that's what excites me and I, I do I do think there's a lot more questions today <laughs> that we've opened up and I really hope that there is a generation out there who will take a lot of this research forward. Yeah, and I get the opportunity to stand up here, look pretty and thank everyone. So, <laughs> I mean, um, I'll, I'd rather just jump straight into that. To be fair. Um, so I'd like to thank all the attendees who've come here today uh, in person and online because I know quite a contingent have actually joined uh, from across the pond as well. So I'd also like to thank the captioners. I'd like to thank Lizzie at the back there who pulled Woo. off this conference. I think <laughs> yeah. she deserves a hand down. Yeah, so. Also for Troy and our tech team and all the speakers here who've really made this a very varied, rich, colourful conference that we've had here today. So I would like to say, if you take a little look at your programmes as well, there is a screening at the DCA later today of I Know Where I'm Going. I think um, it takes part at, let me see, six o'clock. So um, if you uh, see the... Uh, you'll be able to go there. Uh, you can get your tickets from the DCA box office and it will be followed by networking and uh, socialising and drinks as well in the Jute Bar. So yeah, I'd like to thank you all again and in fact, I'd like to thank my colleagues here as well on a oh, personal yeah. note in fact, even for oh, the past two and a half years, this journey that we've yeah. been on to get to this moment as well and to yeah. see you go. So, I know. Yeah. I know. So, so yeah. catch it for a close of Sunday. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's other message. Last yeah. day is Sunday as yeah. well. That was the last yes. message that Lizzie put down as well. So yeah, thank last you. And I, I just want to add one extra sort of thank mm -hmm. you to somebody so, who's not here, Sophie. who was Sophie McKinley, who was the previous director of programmes, who first approached me and asked me would I be interested in working on this project and put me together with these three mm -hmm. marvellous people. So Sophie, I know you're maybe not tuning in, but you're there with us in thought. So. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, big Absolutely. thanks to Sophie. Yeah. Absolutely. Brilliant. Yeah. So a big round of applause again for everyone today. Uh, thank you again.